one of the end time events that's brought to, to view in the Bible is the millennium or the 1,000 years. Surprisingly, the 1,000 years is only mentioned in one passage of the scripture, and that's in Revelation chapter 20. But because it's only mentioned once in one location, it seems as though Christianity has just kind of built on this on that one uh, location, and it's all different kinds of thoughts and understandings and interpretations and disputes with what the millennium is all about. But we're going to start with the first three verses um, that, that Brother Dan had used for the scripture reading. Revelation 20, verses 1 to 3. <clears throat> John says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. Amen? <laughs> and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. So there's good news tucked in this verse, right? Satan's going to be bound. No opportunity for deception anymore. Amen. I love that thought. I think that's great. Maybe you're not affected by it, but I definitely am. So to correctly interpret the millennium, however, we have to look at it in the setting of the great controversy and in the context of the Day of Atonement, which we've talked about through this series. So in this study, we're going to begin with what marks the beginning of the thousand years. What takes place during the thousand years? And then what happens at the end of the thousand years? So when Jesus comes the second time, the Bible teaches that the wicked will be destroyed by his brightness, while both living and resurrected saints then who have been dead will be taken to heaven. This marks the beginning of the millennium. We're going to look at a couple of texts. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. This has been known as the, lou the, the loudest verse in the scriptures because it wakes up the dead. That we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Thus shall we shall always be with the Lord. Just a quick thought. Do you want to be righteous dead when Jesus re returns? Or do you want to be righteous living when Jesus returns? Any would want to be righteous dead when Jesus returns? Raise your hand. Okay. So I'm going to assume that the opposite is everybody's request. Those that want to be alive when Jesus returns, raise your hand. Okay, I see some that didn't raise your hand. A little undecided, and that's okay. <coughs> okay, just a thought. I better not dwell on that. So in these two verses, we have a lot that's happening. When Jesus returns, there's a lot of racket. There's a shout. There's a voice of the archangel. There's a trumpet of God. And what happens? Well, the dead in Christ, the faithful who are dead at the time, will raise. But not just raise, it says they'll rise first. If they're first to rise, who are the second? Well, we who are alive at Jesus when he returns, at his coming. We'll meet them in the air. This is the resurrection of the righteous. All the righteous who ever lived the ones who have believed in Jesus Christ as their Lord, personal Lord, and Savior. This is the first resurrection. So there's a first, must be a second. And we'll address that in a minute. But this is the blessed hope of you and I. This is the blessed hope of the believers. 
Revelation chapter 20 continues. I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast uh, of his image and had not received his mark on their forehead or on their hand. They lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection, and blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. There's no power. The second death has no power. You will not die again ever and ever and ever when we partake of the first resurrection, right? Amen is right. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and they shall reign with him a thousand years. What else happens at the beginning of the thousand years? First Corinthians says this. Paul says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. I've mentioned this once before, and I'll mention it again because it was kind of, this is kind of a, comical thought. The King James Version says that in, the, in the, the verse before that, at the last trump. Yeah. It doesn't say trumpet. It says trump. Don't think that's an indication who's going to win the presidential nomination, but it's there. If he does win, he is the last trump. Praise God. <laughs> we can get this all behind us. 2 Thessalonians 2 says, And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Jeremiah 4. There's a lot of behelds in this. I beheld, Jeremiah says, the earth. And indeed, it was without form and void. And the heavens, they had no light. I beheld the mountains. And indeed, they trembled. And all the hills moved back and forth. I beheld, and indeed there was no man. And all the birds of the heavens had fled. I beheld, he says, and indeed the fruitful land was a wilderness, and all its cities were broken down at the presence of the Lord by his fierce anger. And one more text. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who was the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. So here we have, so far, what marks the beginning of a thousand years. Jesus returns. Remember we read it, he'll descend from heaven with a shout. Again, this is our hope. This is the Christian hope. This is the blessed hope of his glorious appearing that Titus tells us that we're so badly looked. Are you not looking forward to this hope? Are we looking forward to this hope? We, we, we must be looking forward to this hope. Isaiah says, and it will be said in that day, behold, we will say, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is our Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and we will rejoice in his salvation. Is this not the day they are, we are looking forward to? This begins the thousand years. Also at the beginning of the thousand years, the righteous are resurrected and changed from corruption to incorruption, mortal to immortality in a moment. And Jesus says in uh, John chapter 5. I don't have this one on the screen. John chapter 5, looking at verses uh, 28 and 29, he says, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good, to the resurrection of life. Those who have done evil, to the resurrection of condemnation. Also at the beginning of 
the millennium. The wicked will be slain, we read, by the, righteous, uh, by the brightness of Jesus' coming. Jeremiah says that he saw no man on the earth, and it was desolate. We also read that the, that the earth will be desolate and ruined. What is fruitful now is wasted because of sin. You know, one of the things I'm looking forward to is there are a lot of really beautiful places here, right? I mean, we've been to Hawaii, been to New Zealand, the UP, a lot of beautiful places. What's wrong with the UP? <laughs> Apparently you've never been there. <laughs> and as beautiful as it is, what was it like prior to sin? Right? So I'm looking forward to seeing what did God have in mind at the very beginning before the flood when he first created, when it came fresh from his hands. I'm kind of anxious to see what that's going to be like. Yeah, wow, I was right. But what is fruitful is now wasted because of sin. In fact, the, de the description in Revelation 20 where we read about Satan being thrown into the bottom of this pit for a thousand years is the same word that is being used in Genesis chapter 1 where it says it was without form and void. That's what the earth is going to reduce to. That's the result of sin. God starts it out 6,000 years ago, starts it perfect, takes 6,000 years to ruin it back to what it was at the very beginning. Empty and void. That's what sin does. The words of Busa or abyss, it'll be chaotic on this planet. So since the righteous will have been taken to heaven and the wicked have been destroyed by Jesus' brightness at his coming, Satan then is bound to this desolate planet with his angels that he's deceived for a thousand years. Everyone is gone. Everything is ruined. So evidently the, the great chain which Satan is bound is a chain of circumstances. No one to deceive. No lives to twist and destroy. No longer does he have access to human beings. His hands are tied. Nothing to do but wander to and fro on the earth and reflect of the results of his rebellion against God. Did you, did you study the quarter? Are you studying the quarter this, this, this time on the book of Job? Very first chapter opens up. God says, where'd you come from? What was Satan's response? To and fro on the earth. God then presents to him, Job, the righteous. Have you considered him? Now he's bound by circumstances. Now he's bound to, so where have you come from, Satan? To and fro on the earth. So how's that going for you? Do you see now the results of your sin, of your rebellion against me, of your selfishness, of your pride? Do, now you, do you get it? We're going to find out that he doesn't get it. So quickly, five times a review. Beginning of the thousand years, Jesus returns. The righteous uh, are resurrected and changed. The wicked are slain. Earth is devastated. Satan is bound. So what will be going on now during those thousand years? <clears throat> Back to Revelation 20. John says, I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was committed to them and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. 1 Corinthians 6 is, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you, not, are you unworthy to judge in the smallest matters? Do you not uh, know that we shall judge angels? How much more than things that pertain to this life? So during the thousand years, the saints will be in heaven participating in the judgment. Now, they will not be deciding who is saved or who is lost because God has already done that determination. 
they will simply confirm the judgments of God. Well, someone has said that in the judgments there are going to be three surprises. Um, one is that someone who you thought was going to be there isn't. And the other one is somebody that you uh, uh, thought should be there but is. And then the third surprise is that you're there. So during this time, every doubt about God's dealing with a sin problem will be removed. Have you been studying the quarterly of Job? Do you see what's going on in the book of Job? Do you see the accusations that the, that the devil's bringing up against God? You're not fair, you're arbitrary. And, and the big question is, if you're sovereign, why haven't you dealt with this then? Where have you been? What's the deal? God of love? Come on. Show it to me. The whole book of Job will be covering this for us this, this Sabbath. So during this time, during the millennium, every doubt about God's dealing with the sin problem will be removed. God must be vindicated. Again, as I mentioned in the beginning, this is all based on the great controversy, the accusations. Who's right? God right or is the devil right? Right? This will be cleared. God must be vindicated. Otherwise, how can we trust him in heaven? How will heaven ever be fun? Right? So in a sense, this judgment is about God himself, right? Can he be trusted? Heaven must be secure. And it will be. So during the thousand years, all these questions concerning God's dealing with the sin problem, they'll be answered. And the saints will be satisfied that God was just and true in all of his ways. Yeah, I already, have, I already mentioned this. And Job, if God is love, why does he allow bad things to happen? The saints will say, I will praise you with an uprightness of heart when I learn of your righteous judgment. We've already read in Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 and 2, but let's read it again with verse 3. We saw that in the first two verses, that angel comes down from heaven and binds Satan for a thousand years. Then verse 3 says he cast him into the bottomless pit, shut him up, set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. Now in Isaiah chapter 24, it shall come to pass that in that day, the Lord will punish um, on high the host of the exalted ones and on the earth the kings of the earth they will be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit and will be shut up in the prison and after uh, uh, many days they will be punished so it will look like this during the thousand years saints will be in heaven judging the wicked Satan and his angels are bound alone on earth in total devastation um, and darkness. No people are alive on the earth. So the end of the thousand years, Revelation 20, verse 3, and he cast Satan into the bottomless pit that he should deceive the nations um, no more till the thousand years were finished, but after that he must be released a little while. Verse 5, but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. Revelation verses uh, 7 through 10. Now when a thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and he'll go out to deceive the nations, to gather them to battle. Mm. Doesn't look as though he's changed much, does it? Whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. For, uh, same chapter 14 to 15 says, then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Another silly question. How many want, how many know that your name is written in the book of life? How many want their name written in the book of life? 
we can know that our name is written in the book of life. We can know that. Because of what Jesus has done. The life he gave. The life he lived. The death uh, life he gave. Gave everybody life. One more verse. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. So the events at the close of the thousand years look like this. Jesus returns with the saints and the holy city. The wicked are raised. This is the second resurrection. And Satan is released from his, from his prison. Satan deceives the wicked into attacking the city. The wicked are judged. And there's a new heaven and a new earth. My wife didn't like this picture. What does it look like there? Yeah. She said, that's creepy. It is creepy, isn't it? The closing events uh, in the earthly sanctuary was called the Day of Atonement. This was the last thing that they did in the sanctuary service when it was on earth. It was called the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. It's actually sometime this month, and I don't know what day it is this, this, this year. On that day, there were two goats that were chosen. One was the Lord's goat. It was killed and offered up as a sacrifice. The process was all the sins that had accumulated throughout the year were collected in um, the sanctuary. The sanctuary had to be cleansed. If you had participated in the service, your sins had gone before, and then they were cleansed. And when the high priest came out of that room, there was a blessing on the camp. If you had accepted Jesus Christ, if you had accepted the Lamb of God, you were covered by his blood. Day of atonement, day of judgment was what it was. If you had not participated in that scene throughout the year, when a day of atonement, when a day of judgment came, you were separated from the camp. You were separated from those who had participated in having Jesus' blood cover your sin. You were kicked out. This is the same event. There was a cleansing. There was a removing of sin during this atonement. In a nutshell, without explaining any further, we are now living in that day. We are now living in the day of judgment. So where do you stand? Are your sins there? Has, has Jesus Christ been your Lord and Savior? Are you covered by his blood? Have you accepted his blood? One was the Lord's goat. It was killed and offered up as a sacrifice. The other was the scapegoat, Azazel, which means Satan. The sins of the people were placed on it and was, it was led into the wilderness to die. The, placing the sins of the world on the originator of sin. As justice demands, the one responsible for sin's existence must be dealt with. And Satan will be cast into this lake of fire and never exist ever more. This is the, mon the, the meaning of the millennium of, of, of Millennium's judgment. And God himself will be vindicated that day of atonement. He will put the blame for this havoc that sin has produced where it really belongs, and that's on Satan. Isn't God a just God? Isn't he a fair God? How else can it be done? Right? He just doesn't say, okay, that's done, great. We'll move on. He just doesn't cover it. So the millennium is part of the final judgment scene that's actually revealed in the Day of Atonement when sin will be removed and everlasting righteousness will be ushered in. God cannot eradicate sin nor usher in everlasting righteousness until 
all doubt about him and his dealing with the sin problem is removed. Otherwise, there will forever remain doubt and question. So the scenario that, calm, uh, that, that represents the culmination events is, is the great controversy between Christ and Satan, which began first in heaven, continued on earth at the fall. This conflict of the ages began in the mind of Lucifer. He envisioned a new philosophy of happiness, one completely at odds with the nature and the character and the government of God. Prophet Ezekiel describes what happened. You were perfect in the ways that you, from the day that you were created till inequity was found in you. Isaiah tells us what this inequity was all about. He says, how you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how you were cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. So Isaiah writes that this rebellious idea that Satan's mind centered around the elevation of self to the highest level and the most importance in life. This in time transformed Lucifer, the covering cherub, into Satan, the enemy of God. But his downfall was internal. In his mind, where all sin begins. Satan's purpose in taking control of the earth was to demonstrate the superiority of this philosophy. He argued that he could improve on what God had created and make life more enjoyable. He attempted to do this by introducing the principle of self first. This is the concept that he introduced in heaven for which he was cast out. But now the great controversy rages on earth. Have you noticed that? Where self-interest is now acknowledged as the prime motivator in society. Which debate do I have to refer to in order to get this as a picture? However natural it seems, it lies complete contradiction to the principle of God's agape love, which does not seek its own. I may have shared with this before, and you've probably heard this before. The acronym for WAR, W-A-R, is WE ARE RIGHT. So one purpose of the millennium, then, is to give Satan a chance to contemplate what his principles have wrought on the earth. Thus, all, he, all can see, then, the true character of sin that's expressed graphically to the universe. And again, all will confess to God, just and true are your ways. This is why God has allowed sin to enter the world and to play itself out to the bitter end. Satan's playing his cards and he's lost. Solomon says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. So when it's all said and done, sin produces chaos and death. Living for self may sound like it's good in theory, but it leads to greed, leads to strife, leads to wars, and to self-destruction. And even though Satan and his angels have been, had a thousand years to contemplate what's the result, we notice that they manifest the same spirit when the wicked are raised in the attempt to surround the city of God. Nothing's changed. And God will destroy them out of mercy in a world that there's no room for self. When Christ came into this earth some, some 2,000 years ago, he set out to deliver mankind from the curse of the law, as well as from the principle of self, which Paul calls the law of sin and death. This deliverance, in part, is part of the good news of the gospel. In Christ, the entire human race was set free from the law of sin and death. 
in receiving Christ by faith, we surrender our sinful and selfish nature to the cross. Paul says in Galatians, and those who are Christ have crucified the flesh and with his passions and with his desires. It's no longer just me. And the cross of Christ is God's verdict on sinful flesh that is dominated by the principle of self. It's only fit to be consumed. And the millennium is clearly part of God's plan of redemption, to dispose of sin and its effects on creation. Up to that point, again, as we're learning in Job, God himself has assumed the blame for sin's terrible effects, for he has allowed it to take its course. But the millennium and the resurrection of the wicked will prove beyond a shadow of a doubt the viciousness of sin, even after, of a, after the thousand years of quarantine. So clearly God is not the author of rebellion. Lucifer and his seductive system has deceived millions. And now that system is being fully exposed for what it is to the universe. The millennium is clearly, again, the culmination of God's great plan of redemption. And in the end, Revelation says that every knee will bow. And I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands of so thousands will say with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and glory and honor and blessings. And every creature which is in the heaven and on the earth and under the sea and such as are in the sea, all that are in them, I heard saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. Amen. God has given us his son for our salvation. There's no reason, no reason at all why anyone should be lost. As he reaches out to you, make a decision to follow the lamb wherever he goes. Why wait? 